Today's sermon comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, or excuse me, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. 1 through 6. Again, the passage is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. This is the word of God. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give light the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. All right. Um, good morning. Now, can I have your attention? One, uh, one person this morning told me that I look gloomy today, so I got to put extra smile. Hi. I'll try my best. Since we keep this Sunday as a mission Sunday, I'm going to talk about mission. And some of us probably, possibly may think that I know what he's talking about. I, I know what he's going to talk about. You know, I know the message. It's going to be about pray for their, either pray for the missionaries or give some offering donation to the missionaries that we may support and help them out or join and go or short-term mission or something like that. And it's, you know, it's going to be like that. It's whenever we talk about mission, it's going to be one of those. No, I'm not. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. I mean, they are important. They are important. Don't get me wrong. Let me just, no question about it. That's what we're supposed to do. We got to pray for the missionary. We got to support them in any way we can. Either financially or we physically go and help them out. Whatever we can do, that is what we need to do. That's the task of the church. Not only the missionaries, we need to get involved in the overseas missions. That's who we are. But that's just not the focus of today's message. That's all I'm saying. Actually, as I was preparing for this message... <laughs> I noticed that this sermon was getting really, really long, and I didn't want to preach one-hour sermon today. If I preach the all things, it's going to be one hour, I think, and especially we have the Lord's Supper, so I had to cut it short. So I'm going to do, as you can see from the screen, part one today and part two next week. Am I not gracious? <laughs> if the spirit moves, maybe I will give one hour sermon. No, I'm not. The Lord willing, I will give the part two next week. Uh, all I'm going to talk about today is what is our mission and what is the hope, motivation of our mission. That's all I'm going to talk about today. And the next week, how can we do that? And so more practical part, I will speak next week more, but I just had to split up because we don't want to give too long. All I'm going to do, so I'm going to focus from our text, just one verse. And then I will unpack the rest of the text next week. Just one verse today. When we hear the word mission, we tend to limit that it is for the missionaries. Those who are called to missions, that's, you know, that's their mission. All we need to do is that we are just helping out their mission. It is their mission, and we just help their mission. What about you, then? Don't you have a mission? I want you to think about it. 
All Christians are called to Jesus himself, called to him, and at the same time, sent out into this world by Jesus. You all have mission, and I'm asking you, what is your mission? Not the mission of a missionary, but what is your mission? What is your life about? Just getting some degree and get a job and hopefully make six figures. That's not your mission. Or make a lot of money and give offering to the church. Maybe we can build a nice church building. That is not your mission. I hope your life is not just about eating well and filling your stomach and live on. And is, is that the purpose of your Christian life? What are you doing? What is your task? Like, whatever I do, I got to do it for this. That's my calling. That is my mission. It's your mission, my mission, hope of glory, our mission. This is the mission that God has given to me. What is it? Did you forget about your mission? How terrible is it? Like, for example, like CIA, the agent is like, I forgot about my mission. I don't know what it is. So many Christians live their lives in a way that, I don't know what my mission is. I mean, I'm helping out their missions, but what is my mission? Let's just say in this way. Let's say your younger brother or your son one day came to you and is saying something like, you know what, not that I will ever going to do it, but I don't know if, you know, drug is that bad. Now some of it is, you know, even not even illegal. It's like, I don't know if it's really bad, you know, Christian mission. I don't know. Um, I will never going to do it. But I don't know about that. What would you say if your son says that? Or let's say your younger sister, teenager, or your daughter, when they become teenager, let's just say she one day come and say, no, I don't know about Having sex with boyfriend is that bad before getting married. Like, if they really love each other, if they really love each other, you know? And not that I'm ever going to do it. Like, I'll never do that. But I don't know if it is that bad. What would you say? Now, you know what that means. When they say that, uh, even though they say, I'll never do that, and when... When they say that, if the opportunity comes, they will do it. And right at the moment when you hear that, whew, that just makes your heart nervous and worried about it. And you make them to sit down and sit down. Come here, sit down. And you start to give a lecture. How, why it is bad, wrong, and sin. And right at the moment, I think most likely, whatever you say, it's just the things are flying over their heads. They're just not coming into their mind because they don't have a conviction. You need to understand this. Why they don't listen to you when you make them to sit down and start to give them a lecture? Because there's a bigger cultural narrative that's going on that they are living in. You need to understand in what cultural narrative they are living in. Through media, from friends, movie, TV, songs, and etc. There are messages they listen to, they hear. And they buy that. They listen to the stories of this culture. You know what? Many people say this. You know what smart person on the TV say that if it is on the TV and if it is on the media, it gives some credential. Like, it must be right, right? And it's not just a couple people. So many people think in this way. And to them, that justifies it. It's just like many people say that. What is, that's a smart person. He's a doctor. He's a counselor. One day, my son was watching Nick Jr. on the TV. It is a children's channel. The Nick Jr. is like preschool and little kid watching that TV. I was walking through my living room, and I saw one commercial on the Nick Jr. Little kid TV channel. It was by Disney. 
and all kinds of different kinds of kids coming in. I'm proud of myself. Be proud of yourself. Like it's all about you are special. Be proud of yourself. And in the background, there's a rainbow flag. And you know what they mean. And this is who you are. And you can be whatever you want. And it's fine. It's like, you are the princess. You are the prince. Be proud of what you can do. That, that was on the TV. And the children are watching it. Now, think about it. From a little childhood, growing up in this cultural narrative, the messages. Humility is not the desirable virtue. You got to have pride. You can be all you want. And to some degree, you know, the parents teach that to you, the children. Whatever you feel, you got to do them. Whatever you like, you got to do it. You can be whatever you want to be. It is good. Be confident in you. Have pride in you. And that is far from the biblical teaching. The Bible does not make you at the center of the world. The Bible makes God at the center of the world. The biblical message teaches us that it is okay that even if you are unsure of yourself, be sure of God. It is okay that you do not know about your future, what you can do. Trust God. Elijah, by himself, standing against over 450 prophets of the Baal, the false prophet. Like, this is just me and all of them are saying that. It is okay. Gideon's 300 people against thousands and thousands of people. Trust him. It's not about the number of people. You don't have to figure out everything about your life. What are you going to be? What are you going to do? How things are going to happen. What Bible teaches, you don't need to figure out everything. Trust your father. Find your identity in him. Find your hope in him. It's so different. The mission that our Lord Jesus gave to you and me, to us, living here in America, here in this Southern California, in Orange County, in this generation, we see the mission in Matthew chapter 28, famous chapter, famous verses. Go make, what? Disciples. Did you forget your mission? Make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them, teach your children, teach your people, teach each other, teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. That is the reason why we go to overseas. But that is also true here in America, in Southern California, in this culture that we live in. Making disciples of our children, our friends, neighbors, co-workers, people around us, including the person next to you right now. The fellow believers. When one is having suffering time and shaking their faith Trust in the Lord. One is trying to go off the track of the Christian life. You got to repent and turn back. Point each other to Christ. Continue to walk in faith and obedience. That's the discipleship. That's your mission. That's your mission. Whatever job you work at. In your home, your family, your husband, your wife, your children. And here, wherever you are, teach them to observe. Make them disciples of Christ.
especially in this culture that is so anti-biblical. Make them disciples of Jesus. Now, some of you may think, man, well, Pastor Billy, raising our children to be godly Christians in this culture is so hard. Evangelizing our neighbor, even talk about it at work, at school, is so hard. Helping my friends, even believing friends who are suffering, helping them to continue to walk in faith, in crisis. It's just so hard in this generation, in this culture. That's just so anti-God culture we are living in. You're right. It is hard. It is hard. I'm trying to smile because I'm very blessed today. It is hard. The whole orientation of life, the worldview, the life priority, self-identity, values of life, the ultimate reference point of what is right and what is wrong, there has to be a shift from man-centered, people-centered to God-centered. That's got to take place first. In other words, but I think... But people say from that to, this is what the Lord says. That shift in their heart, in the children's heart, and the people. But I think, but I, I from man center to, but he said, but he said, if there's got to be a shift in them, not just you talking, this got to be done within their hearts. Unless that takes place first, there's not going to be a real change, real transformation. It is a hard mission. And brothers, sisters, Jesus did not call us to the easy mission but hard one so that we may rely on him. Before I go into what we need to do then in this generation, which I said I'm going to do next week, the Lord willing, the more detail of this, I'll just address this what is the hope of this hard mission what motivates us to do so oh, can I raise my children to be a godly man and woman of God it's going to be hard what is your hope in doing so here in the today's text verse 1 Paul said, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. That one verse I'm going to focus today. Now, whenever I said, whenever we see a word, therefore, therefore, we got to look what's been said before, previously. And here, Paul, throughout in 2 Corinthians, from the beginning up to this point, Paul was defending his apostleship, his ministry, because people accuse the authenticity of his ministry, so he's defending it. And Paul shared how hard for him it was to carry this mission, this ministry, because people reject him, people refuse to listen to him, people refuse his message. Not only that, they persecuted him. Not just turning him down, but physically in many ways persecuted him, threatened him, so on. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the afflictions we experience in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength. It was so hard. It was so hard that we dis despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And at the same time, Paul says, chapter 2, verse 14, but thanks be to God. It was so hard. Paul at the same time saying, but thanks be to God. Who in Christ always, always, Lead us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. 
And chapter 3 says, now that we are sufficient in ourselves, it's not about our competency, like I'm, my qualification, my strength, my wisdom is in me. No, not that. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. And these all things can be summarized how he opened this letter in chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. I am doing this, I call to do this, by the will of God. And I want you to get that, the will of God in our mission. You need to understand and see your mission in that God-centeredness that is His will. Your mission of making disciples begins with God, carried by God, and will be accomplished by God. Will of God. You must see His will above everything. Let me go back. Church, are you with me? I think with me. Let's go back to the very beginning of the bigger narrative than our cultural narrative. The story. The Genesis. Adam and Eve, after they have sinned against the creator, the creature disobeyed their creator. God could have just wiped away the entire human race, Adam and Eve, right at that moment and bring the final judgment on that day. Instead, it was God who gave the promise of redemption that the offspring of the woman will crush the serpent's head, the head of the devil. I give you the redemption. It was God who initiated that. And after that, we see the story of the Bible. The sins of idolatry and all kinds of evil filled the earth. And once again, God could have wiped away the entire human race with flood. But he spared some to Noah's family. It was God. And again, he assured the promise to Noah. You see? And he chose a new humanity. He started with Abraham. Now, Abraham was not a special person, though we call him a father of faith and friend of God. God did not give, pick Abraham because of his righteousness, because he was perfect. Look at the story of Abraham. Abraham lied about his own wife multiple times for his own security to a foreign man. Like, you can have her, it's just not my wife. Now, like, if you watch modern-day movie, like a romantic movie, a man who loves the woman so much, like, I'm willing to die for you. It's totally opposite of that. That's Abraham. What about Patriarch? His children. Isaac was a little wimpy kid. And Jacob cheated his father, lied to his father so that he can have more blessing and money, ran away from his own brother. What about the Jacob's children? The 12 tribes, the Patrick of the 12 tribes. One going around and messing with other people, try to fill. One sleeping with the father's concubine. And ten of them standing together, debating with each other whether they should kill one of their brothers or sell him as a slave. That's the Patrick of the 12 tribe of Israel. Yet God still kept his promise. Still spared them. And keep going. Made them into a nation and gave them a law how to live as God's people. And God, it was God who gave them the system of sacrifice and the priest, the way they can be forgiven. 
Now, what about leaders of Israel then? You read the book of Judges. If you read the book of Judges, the judges of Israel, the leaders of Israel, it's hard to even distinguish if they are good guys or bad guys. The good guys sounds like bad guys. The bad guys is like, it's still all the same. These good guys, they're supposed to be the leaders of Israel. They do all kinds of unlawful things and the evil thing too. And one guy even killed his own daughter. What's going on here? And at the end of the book of Judges, it ends with this way, like, each one has done, acted in a way, whatever seems right in their own eyes. Whatever seems right in their own eyes, they just did it. So now they ask for a king. We are reading the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel. What about Saul, the first king? He disobeyed God because he wants to have some money or wealth for his pocket himself from the good, the plunder of the world. Like, he lied to God. Like, oh, mm. oh, what about David, the man after God's own heart? He committed adultery and murder. And we wonder what would happen if he was not a man after God's own heart. His son Solomon, the most wise one, went after the idols and idols and idols to the point that the kingdom, the Israel, has to be divided into two, the northern kingdom and southern kingdom. And the ten tribes in the northern kingdom and the kings, they continue to walk in sin and idolatry, in evil, fill the land to the point that God made them to go in exile. And southern kingdom after northern kingdom got destroyed. They still did not repent and continued in the same way, got destroyed. And after about 70 years, they came back to their own land. Now we come to the story of Jesus. The redeeming king. The promise of God is finally here. And people rejected him. Brothers and sisters, we say, you know what, this culture, this world is so dark. It is so hard to follow God, follow Jesus. You look at the Bible, the sin has been always dark. And what carried through the whole time was God, His will. He will accomplish it. His will. It was not based on the people's qualification, the people's wisdom or power or their willpower. We will do this. Never. It has never been in that way. It was always God. I want you to remember the mission begins with God, and God was the one who continued, and he will accomplish. Brothers and sisters, do you remember the prayer of Jesus in the mountain of Olive of Gethsemane? Before his crucifixion? Wouldn't it be nice if Jesus prayed there and said, Father, I will go through this crucifixion and facing the judgment of God because for these sinners because I love them so much. And if we read that, it will be like, oh. But that's not what Jesus prayed. And you know what Jesus prayed there. Father, if it is possible, remove this cup from me. But not my will, but yours will be done. The main driving force for Jesus to die on the cross, above all, above all, no question. Yes, his love for us, that he willingly laid down his life. But more than that, the main core driving force for Jesus to die on the cross was the will of the Father. And the Son is obeying to the will of the Father. That's what drove Jesus to the cross. God's will of our will save them, purify them, 
sanctify them and have them as my his will and the son obeying the will of the father that made the cross what is the hope of our mission in making disciples teaching our children pointing each other to Christ or including going to the overseas are we going to be successful in this is this is not meaningless are these people ever going to change The hope and confidence of our mission is the will of God that is stronger than anything else above us, bigger, wider, deeper, higher than the strength of this culture, the influence of the message of this world, His will. That's the picture we see in the Bible. Even though this culture we live in is so anti-God, anti-Christ, His people will take delight in God because God will do it. Now having that in mind, my brothers and sisters, let's read the verse one once again. Would you? Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God. Not that we need him. Not that we are doing it for him. We are doing by the mercy of God and we can do this by the mercy of God. And Paul says, so we do not lose heart. Let me end with this. Church, go make disciples. Teach them to observe all that Christ has commanded you. And remember, Jesus did not end right there. He said something else. I will be with you until the end of the age. You're not going to do this by yourself. You're not doing it for me. Oh, I'm doing God a favor by teaching this and helping them and go. I will be with you when you teach your children, when you evangelize, share gospel with your friends. You are not there by yourself. I will be with you. That's our confidence in making disciples that our work is not going to be wasted. Parents, in this generation, in this culture, do that with prayer. That there's going to be a deep conviction and change of heart. From what I think, but people say, to what the Lord said. And we'll be able to say one day, as Paul said earlier, thanks be to God who gave us triumph procession. And through us spread the fragrance of knowledge of God everywhere. And more detail, I will share next week. Lord willing, I'm going to end like a Korean drama. You gotta wait anxiously wait for the next day. Let's pray.